This is Michael Jackson as he's never been seen before. Okay. Here, here, he's touching you. Watch it, we're lifting up the windows. These images were captured by psychic Yuri Geller, a man who counted Michael as a close friend. He just hugged me. And you know what? That hug. <laughs> Yuri was a companion and witness to the stars. And that's me. <laughs> and his home videos offer an intimate insight into the personal world of Michael Jackson. You're crushing him! You're crushing him! Honor Michael! Now Uri has agreed to open up his archive for this program to give a personal portrait of one of the greatest icons of our time. I really shouted, Michael, Michael, stop it. Michael, you will die. You're killing yourself. This is my friend Michael Jackson, Uri's story. This is Michael Jackson on a visit to Britain a few years ago. By his side is Uri Geller. Don't fall, don't fall, please. Take, take that. Watch it, watch it. Uri shared a friendship with Michael that few others enjoyed. The man that I love so much is going to be my best man. The man agreed to, to be my best man in a Jewish ritual. Wow. Michael, in private moments, shared his own dreams with Uri that it was possible to get Michael Jackson to the moon. And I relayed this to Michael. I mean, the idea of, of, of him being able to actually do his moonwalk on the moon. Yuri Geller is Michael Jackson calling. Um, when you get this message, please know that I, I, wish, I pray that we do the moon trip. I want to be the first one to do it in the pop world. And he shared his ambitions. You know, when Michael heard that Steven Spielberg got a knighthood, um, Michael wanted a knighthood too. And I understand, come on, he should have gotten a knighthood, really. But at times, their friendship was tested. Don't tell me. Don't. This is my private life. Stop. Stop there. Uri even questioned Michael about the most private areas of his life. I asked him. Mike, did you ever touch a child in an inappropriate manner? This is the story of an at times turbulent friendship. There was something that bonded us. I think it was the turmoils and the traumas that we went through in our lives that kind of linked us together in a strange and bizarre way. Back in the 70s, Uri was one of the biggest stars around. He rose to fame with his spoon bending and psychic abilities. This is so heavy. Yes, it's happening. It's happening. Yes, it's better. He appeared on chat shows around the globe. Look, I'll show it to the camera. You are. I don't know whose kid this is, but it's... Among his fans was a young Michael Jackson. If you look at it very slowly, it is still bending. Now... And years later, in 1999, the pair would meet in a New York hotel room through their mutual friend, Harrods owner, Mohammed Al-Fayed. I didn't know what to expect. So there I was, sitting on this couch and looking around, and, and suddenly, out of his bedroom, comes out Michael Jackson. He must have come out of his, the bathroom of his suite because he wasn't wearing a shirt. His black hair was combed backwards and he actually looked handsome. And I jumped up and I said, Michael, you look fantastic. I knew the love would bring this happiness I'm being. I tried to keep my sanity. I During several trips to New York, their friendship was cemented. Uri even designed part of the sleeve note for Michael's Invincible album. Soon plans were being put in place for Michael to visit Uri in Britain. It was 2001 and Uri was planning to renew his wedding vows with his wife Hannah. He needed a best man. I, I call Michael Jackson and I tell him, Michael, listen, I'm renewing my wedding vows. Will you be my best man? And he said, 
Yeah. I'll be your best man. Of course. You know, I get goosebumps now. The, the most famous man in the world is going to be my, my best man. But, but more important for me was the man that I loved so much is going to be my best man. The man agreed to, to be my best man in a Jewish ritual. Wow. Just months later, Michael Jackson would fly to Britain to be best man at Uri's wedding. But he was on crutches. He'd broken his foot in a fall at his Neverland ranch. On a sunny Wednesday afternoon, guests waited anxiously for the ceremony to begin, but Michael was nowhere to be seen. It looked as though the King of Pop was going to miss Uri's big day. Michael Jackson and Uri Giller had met each other through their mutual friend Muhammad Al-Fayed. They were embarking on a new friendship, during which Uri would see Michael as few have seen him. They would share late-night shopping trips. I almost believe it. And even a private visit to Parliament. Fans would follow them every step of the way as they travelled around Britain. But in 2001, as Michael arrived in London for his first visit to Uri, he had one very special appointment in his diary. Michael had agreed to be Uri's best man as he renewed his wedding vows with his wife, Hannah. The day before the ceremony, Uri had given Michael his wedding ring to look after. I wanted Michael to have the ring on him for 24 hours. I, I wanted Michael Jackson's energy to be absorbed into that wedding ring. I believe in this, you know, come on. Uh, they uh, have two children together. They are, have been married civilly. And the wedding began and Michael hasn't arrived. And I'm beginning to let go and eat. The, the food is laid out there uh, because uh, Michael is late. And um, the, 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 the truth of the, the matter is that we couldn't start the ceremony because my ring was in his pocket. And our passes. And, and he, Michael is not showing up. And we are on the phone. And I'm sweating. I'm running around between the guests trying to comfort them. They, they all had fun. And, and then people thought that this is a, a, a kind of a big setup. And Michael will never this was like a, a prank because they could not believe that the michael jackson is really going to to come to to be my best man and after two long hours michael's and entourage the bell rings and out there the, the gate and i ran the marquee i ran up here and, and looked at the gate and the gate was opening the limousines kind of stream down the driveway and they come up in front of the house and the door uh, slides open and Michael comes out with a crouch and um, I, I bring him here and he sat right here behind uh, on this black sofa and I kind of kneel down and I put my hand on his um, bandages and, and I said, I'm not a healer of course, but I told him, Michael, look, Help me, let me focus my energy into your food. You'll feel okay. Among the guests waiting to meet Michael was journalist Eve Pollard. Um, there was more security than I've ever seen. We've got used to security now, but in 2001, I'd never seen anything like it. I'd edited newspapers. There was more security than you get with a royal attendee. Then, of course, we got into the wedding, and normally, you know, you sit down, you watch the wedding, you have your reception. Michael was so late that people sort of sat down at first, then thought, what am I doing here after 20 minutes? Then they started serving food and drinks because you just couldn't wait for this thing, you know, to get going. And then Michael came in. And then, as always, we were transfixed. We were fascinated to watch him. He sat down for most of the ceremony because he was on crutches, he'd hurt his foot. The crutches, I think, were also, I think, white to match the white skull cap he wore. And 
uh, he was very quiet and I think did recognize it was Uri and Hannah's day. Next Top Model. The Progress. Επτά κορίτσια διεκδικούν τον τίτλο του Next Top Model. Πώ έφτασαν ω εδώ, Πάτι Μπουλέι. When we met at the wedding, at Yuri Gettler's wedding, uh, that was the first time Michael began to tease me about looking like Diana Ross. He'll turn around, look at me in that naughty way. He'll go, ain't no money high enough. Michael? <laughs> He'll just, he would laugh, laugh and giggle, you know. And he said, Patty, you look just like that. There must be a throwback. You just, he, she must come from your family. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so at all. Mazal <laughs> There was kind of this energy, and it's it's Michael's energy. Nobody else. The only person I've come across with that kind of effect is the Pope, really, on people. Just before I was lifted up on the chair, because that's another custom tradition, he just hugged me. And you know what? You know, that, that hug, which... Um, I don't know, lasted for just, um, <laughs> sorry. That hug it was just a few seconds, but it was real love and uh, unconditional. I, it's just so hard for me to, uh, believe that I, he's gone and I haven't spoken to him for a long time but still there is that uh, connection and I comfort myself today just weeks after his death that um, he's there he's up there <laughs> During the same trip to England, Michael attended a book launch. Uri had published letters he'd exchanged with his friend Rabbi Shmuley Boteak. I wrote a book with Rabbi Shmuley Boteach called The Rabbi and the Psychic. Very, very sensitive, powerful book. It started, it's actually started with uh, me writing letters to Shmuley. He wrote back letters to me. And they were so profoundly deep and spiritual and sensitive and revealing that we decided, hey, let's create a book out of the letters because it could help a lot of people. So the book launch was um, scheduled for in England. And Michael agreed to come and help us promote it. It was uh, amazing. The day after the book launch, Michael made his way to the Oxford University Union. He'd been invited to make a speech about the importance of good parenting and to launch a new children's charity, which he'd set up with his rabbi friend. There, there was this huge, massive anticipation waiting for Michael Jackson to come. You know, I bet with you that most of the kids there did not believe that Michael will come. He, this was no, not, not, not true. And uh, it was a rainy evening, and um, you know that there is uh, space in the hall for maybe, I don't know, 300 people, maybe 400, I don't remember. My goodness, there were hundreds and hundreds of students lined up outside the auditorium, the hall. And uh, when we arrived, it was... Some were clapping hands, some were shouting, some were running to take pictures. Michael had decided to speak about his childhood in his speech and to refer to his own difficult relationship with his father. Author Jonathan Margolis had been with Michael as he travelled to Oxford from London. He decided he wanted to call his dad on the phone. And um, he asked me if I had a phone, which I had. He asked one of his many people in the minibus uh, who had his dad's number in Las Vegas. I think he lived in Las Vegas. 
dialed him and there was this extraordinary conversation of which of course I only heard one side which was just sort of oh hi dad I'm in England um, I'm going to address um, the students at Oxford University and I'm going to talk about you uh, but it's okay it's in a very positive light nothing to worry about and he the father said something and he listened and he finally said um, dad I love you and then handed me the phone back and um, he kind of looked out the window at the the traffic on the M40 and said you know I don't think I've ever said that to him before. At one stage of his speech about his father and forgiving his father, he broke down and cried. It was just maybe 30 seconds to a minute, but it was real, it was genuine. And M Michael didn't cry in kind of public places, unless I'm wrong, but it, it was very, very emotional. And I think all the students were with him. There was, uh, there was silence. We all know that his father was a very strong man um, who wanted Michael to be a superstar. And we all read the times when Michael stood by a window, five years old, six years old, saw other children play baseball, basketball, and then he was probably dragged back into the room to rehearse and practice and sing. So he lost his childhood. He rocks in the tree top all day long Happy and mama, let's sing his song I thought a man is on Jaybrook Street Down there the rhyme and go tweet, tweet, tweet Rock your heart and oh, rock, 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 rock your heart and Friends say it was his attempts to recapture his lost childhood that led to an obsession with Peter Pan. Hey! Theatre director Trevor Nunn met Michael in the 80s when he was seeking his advice about staging a new tour. When I was talking about the kind of staging that I'd done in a show called Starlight Express, he said, uh, that's so much the kind of thing I, I, I want to do. I want to do something different. I, I want to be able to fly over the audience. And I said... Um, that's not a problem. I, I was kind of bantering, I suppose. Uh, no, there's, there's no difficulty. I, I had people flying over the audience when I did Peter Pan. And it was like I had pressed a button that would give him uh, an electric shock. Um, everything changed. Um, he sat bolt upright. He grabbed the arms of the chair. Uh, he said, you did Peter Pan? I, I said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I directed it in, in London. Oh, my God, oh, my God, you directed Peter Pan. And, and the excitement was just overwhelming. He jumped up, he walked around the room, he kept repeating, Peter Pan, oh, my God, Peter Pan. And then I explained to him that we had done the show in London using adult actors to play the children. And that took it one stage further because suddenly he was like with her eyes brim full with tears and he came across the room and he knelt down in front of me and he grabbed my knees and he said, could I play Peter Pan? Is it too late for me to play Peter Pan? It was just the two of us in this huge room. Um, and I I've since wondered, well, well, how often could he reveal that? childlike part of himself and the, the discussion about Peter Pan um, not only released it but I think it showed me that it was not so much a part that he wanted to play it was the person he wanted to be The room would discover Michael's childlike qualities as their friendship grew stronger a second visit to Uri in Britain was already being planned to include a midnight shopping trip to Harrods and a private tour of Parliament. After Michael Jackson's appearance as best man at Uri's wedding in 2001, the friendship between the pair went from strength to strength. They would often talk on the phone. On more than one occasion, they discussed a proposal put forward by an American space enthusiast. I got an email from a scientist, an engineer, that worked in Boeing with ties to NASA. And 
I don't know, the conversation started uh, between me and him that it is, no matter how far out this sounds and how science fiction it signs, sounds, that it was possible to get Michael Jackson to the moon. And I relayed this to Michael. And Michael was extremely ecstatic about it. He was so excited just by, I mean, the idea of, of, of him being able to actually do his moonwalk on the moon. And I remember, I mean, it was really...